Revelations 3, 7 through 13. Hear now the word of the Lord. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shall shut, and who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, Amen. which no one is able to shut. I know that you have a little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word of patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial, which is coming on the whole earth to try those who dwell upon the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. He or she who conquers, I will make them a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall they go out of it. And I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own name. The one who has an end of him, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. That's about it. God, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, it's easy to love you because you're so wonderful. Yes. God, we want to say thank you. Thank you it's Lord. easy to praise you because you brought us a mighty long way. Yes. God, we want to shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because nobody has treated us like you. Yes. So God, come in right now, Lord. Fill your humble servant, Lord. And Lord, let the word go forth. Uh, you said in your word that your word is not bound. Break all limitations. Break every barrier. Let your word go forth. Healing, delivering, saving, and sanctifying, and setting free. Yes. We will give you what is yours, the power, the glory, and the honor. In the name that is above every name, the mighty and the master's name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. God's people say Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, thank God you're here, neighbor. Thank God you're here, neighbor. If there's nobody in your house, go stand in front of the mirror while I do this part. Say, thank God you're here, neighbor. Thank God you're here, neighbor. Tell them, you look good today. You look good today. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Tell them, neighbor. somebody else. Amen. Talk to your dog. Talk to your cat. Amen. Say it out loud. Amen. Maybe there's something in your house that needs to hear the word of God. Tell them, neighbor. Neighbor. Thank God you're here. Thank God you're here. You're important to God. You're to God. And you're important to me. Neighbor. Neighbor. There is a word from the Lord. And there is a word from the Lord. And the word of the Lord this morning. And the word of the Lord this morning. The word of the Lord this afternoon. The word of the Lord this afternoon. His church matters. His church Hear and receive. Hear and receive. Tell them hear, hear what the Spirit with the says, to the says to the church. Amen. Just Amen. wave at this COVID time. Don't shake the hand. Amen. Just wave at Amen. What did I say the title was? Church matters. Phrase reminds one of the phrase Black Lives Matter. Anytime you hear matter now, at least for me, when I hear matter, I think of Black Lives Matter. And Black Lives Matter, a lot of people debate it, but it needed to be said. Yeah. And it needs to be said because when they wrote uh, uh, everyone was created equal, they didn't include black lives. Mm -hmm. When they said everyone is entitled to live life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they didn't include their enslaved Africans. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's right. And even now in many things in this country, Black Americans, African Americans are not included. That's right. So Black Lives Matter needs and will need to be said. Mm -hmm. Needs to be said because of the relentless, never-ending attack on black people by the systems of white supremacy and their logic, yeah. their devaluation of black citizenship, mm -hmm. their denigration of the black community, 
and destruction of black personhood and of black bodies in a relentless way means we keep on needing to say black lives matter. Mm -hmm. Somebody said black lives matter. Black, black lives matter. matter. It needs to be said. It's a, it's a revolutionary message. I walked into a bookstore out in Queens, a Bible store with my Black Lives Matter shirt on, and the fella got all upset. He said, all lives matter. And then I said, yes. We talked about six million Jews, and that is a great tragedy and travesty. I read an article today where the man said that was the worst crime in history. I, I beg to differ. 100 million Africans destroyed, 30 million Native American people destroyed in uh, Latin America and North America. Uh, but the crime of 100 Africans, amen, destroyed. Uh, if you're going to pick the greatest crime, surely that has to be the number one candidate. Black Lives Matter needs to be said. Yes. Black Lives Matter needs to be said because of the relentless self-destruction caused among us against each other. Yes. Because we live in a white racist society that yes. teaches us to put each other down yes. and not stick together. Uh -huh. I like to say Black Lives Matter because black people need to hear Black Lives Matter. Yes. Black people need to hear because too many of us disrespect each other. Black people need to hear Black Lives Matter because too many of us have low self-esteem and low standards. Uh, we need to continue to say Black Lives Matter because too many of us agree with the white racists that black people can be easily attacked and easily destroyed. The phrase Black Lives Matter was able to become popular though because uh, largely part of a book written by that rap by that great black public intellectual, Dr. Cornel West. Dr. Cornel West wrote a best-selling book called Race Matters. If you have not read it, uh, I, I beg you to pick it up. Very profound work some years ago. But recently, Harvard University showed the greatest living black intellectual, Cornel West. And I say that, I've studied many people and many things, but also I know Dr. West, he's a friend of mine. I've been trying to get him here for a long time. Uh, our greatest black living intellectual, Cornell West, Harvard University recently showed him that when it comes to uh, tenure, race matters. Because they refused to even consider him for tenure. After 50 years of involvement with Harvard, mm. went to Harvard as a student, he was in Harvard as an activist. I believe he was there as a graduate student. He was a professor. He came, he left, he came back again. And he said that he thought this is because of his defense of Palestinians, that he felt that many at Harvard uh, did not uh, appreciate his defense of the Palestinians, and they took that as uh, insult to Israel, and so they helped to oust him. But whatever it is, and the fact that they didn't even bring it to a vote, they showed that even in places where liberal whites want to say it doesn't matter, race still matters. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, when you take an analysis of both terms, Black Lives Matter and the older book, Race Matters by Dr. Cornel West, there's an ambiguity in the title. So when I say race matters, you can't be immediately clear on what I'm talking about. I could be talking about matters that relate to race, That's right. issues that relate to race. Or I could be making a statement that race is very important. So I could be saying, uh, 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 race matters. I could be saying race is important, or as I could be saying race matters. Let me tell you some things that are going on with the race, or in the race, or about the race. Mm -hmm. So today, when I say church matters, based, uh, amen, on what God told me to say, that's really what it's based on. But it is related to these two terms, Black Lives Matter and the older book, Race Matters. I want to speak of the church in two ways. Matters that relate to the church, number one. And the church as vitally important to you and I as individuals, but also to society. Can I do that? Yes. yes. We need to talk about church nowadays, don't we? Uh -huh. Because these are difficult days for the world because of COVID, but these are really difficult times for the church. Uh -huh. Even before COVID, there was a growing departure of youth and young adults from the church. Many churches uh, in New York City, and I'm sure in other places, were forced to sell their buildings yeah. because they didn't have enough people in the building to keep the building up. The building is 100 years old. Amen. You got 50 people. Right. 
Hundreds of people died. Many people went back down south. And you didn't have new people coming in joining the church. So yeah. what happened? Many of the churches had to sell their building to the developer, and the developers would build a, a housing complex and then build a real small church yeah. that could accommodate the smaller numbers. COVID-19 has been really hard on churches. Yeah. Many churches have not been able to meet. Some of them are trying to open back up, but one of my friends told me last week, well, we have in-person church, but it's not the same. COVID-19 has been hard on churches. Many pastors have been leaving the church. Some pastors have been frustrated and they say, well, I'm going to go and get another kind of job. And then some churches have faced this dilemma. When you don't have people coming to church, you don't have offerings. Mm -hmm. You don't have offerings, you can't pay the bills. Mm -hmm. You can't pay the bills, you can't pay the preacher. Many preachers have found themselves forced to go out into the work market and find another job. Other preachers have felt so frustrated and depressed, they just said, I can find something else and, and do better than struggle with people. So this has been a rough time for the church. In addition to these things, COVID-19 has meant the death of a tremendous number of church leaders. That's right. All across the country, amen. Even, uh, even related to this church, many of the people that uh, we are friends with, some of them that are already have died. You all know our friend Elder Shemel Caldwell, his apostle died, mm -hmm. amen. And we, we spent a long time praying and talking about it, and I've talked to other friends who've had friends die and pass away from COVID. COVID-19 has been very hard on the church. In the beginning, when churches started streaming, a lot of people streamed, a lot of people joined. But as time went on, people began to fall off. And now, I, I thought it was just our numbers, but as I researched it and talked to people and read, everybody's numbers have fallen off. So we were all the pastors, we were so happy in the beginning, we had a big internet crowd. But as we have persisted and kept on, we found out the crowd has gotten smaller and smaller. There's been a great falling away, as the Bible predicted. In addition to the falling away before COVID, and I read an article, the title of the article struck me, it said, they're not coming back. And I read that, I said, oh my God, what is this talking about? It was talking about people, and the man in the article said, people have learned that they can get along without church. And so then I talked to a friend of mine. We didn't mention an article, and uh, he was inviting me to come to his church and preach. And he said, well, when you come, uh, the crowd might not be like you. It usually is. I said, really? I said, well, what, what happened? He said, well, we opened back up. A lot of people didn't come back. And then I said, they, they're nervous, huh? And then I said, well, one day when they come back, he said, no, they're not coming back. Mm. Exact same thing the article said. And I said, are you serious? And he said, no. He said, it will never be like it was. Mm -hmm. I said, what? If he took his fist and punched me in the, in the stomach, it wouldn't have hit me as hard as that statement. But I thought about what he said, and it, he might be right. It might never be the same. Uh, but the church must go on. And I came to tell you today that church matters. Somebody say church matters. Church matters. Now when I speak of church, I'm speaking of the true church. The uh -huh. true church. Every church is not uh, the true church. In the early church history, when there was, if you read the Bible, you see this, there was a lot of different kind of beliefs. There was a lot of struggle about what is right doctrine. Somebody say right doctrine. Right, right doctrine. doctrine. Somebody say right belief. Right, right belief. belief. And I believe it was Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius of Antioch who came up with the uh, idea of signs of the true church. Somebody say signs. signs. He called them marks. Somebody say marks. Marks, marks of the true church. And Ignatius uh, of, of Antioch, who lived around uh, the first 100 years of Christ, died, some say 108, some say 135, some say 140. He lived around that time, that time, A.D. Uh, he came up with uh, the Note Ecclesiastica. Can I talk to y'all today? Come on, help yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to learn Latin right now. Right. Look at somebody and say, the note tape. The note tape. Ecclesiastica. Ecclesiastica. Oh, I got 
have some good Latin students in here. Look at somebody else said the note. The note. Ecclesiastica. Ecclesiastica. The marks of a true church. How do you tell a true church from an untrue church? Number one, he said it's unified. He, uh -huh. said, he said, first of all, the church is one. Right. It's one being that is unified in Christ. Right. Second of all, the church is holy. Yeah. It's set apart for Christ. Third of all, the church is universal. Uh -huh. uh, the term uh, in the Greek and the Latin, Catholic, means uh, universal. Uh -huh. uh, it means whole. And so you, if you, if you hear the Apostles' Creed, you say, uh, you hear the words, I believe in the one Catholic church. It doesn't mean the church in Rome, because the church was used long before the Catholic church really became uh, established. The word means the universal church. And uh, universal means it includes many different types of people in many different types of places. And last of all, the marks that uh, Ignatius identified was apostolic. Everybody read out to me. The church is one. The church is one. The church is holy. The church is holy. The church is universal. The church is universal. The church is apostolic. The church is apostolic. And by apostolic, he didn't mean the apostolic denomination we know. You wouldn't talk about that. Amen. He was talking about it was established by the apostles as found in the book of Acts. Okay. And that the book of Acts records uh, the early history of the church and the early foundations of the church. Amen. Uh, can I go ahead and preach? Yes. preach now, uh, later on, Martin Luther came and broke away from the Catholic Church. You remember 1517. He nailed his uh, 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg. And he broke away from the Catholic Church. And he came up with uh, uh, four marks of the church. Uh-huh. How many did Martin Luther come up with? Four. All right, I'll put y'all in school just for a minute. Uh, Martin Luther said, if you want to have a true church, this is what you look for. You look for the word. Uh-huh. You look for the sacrament, meaning holy communion. Yeah. Now, the, the Catholic Church has seven sacraments, but the Protestant Church under Martin Luther had two. The, the, the communion and preaching. Okay? Uh -huh. But so Martin Luther also says the word, the sacrament, preaching. And then someone else, uh, I believe John Calvin perhaps, added church discipline. So Protestants figure out four marks of the church. If you want to find out what's a true church, the word has got to be there. Amen. If you want to find out what's a true church, the sacrament, holy communion has to be there. Because uh -huh. Jesus commanded us to do that. If yeah. you want to find out what a true church is, they have to preach the whole counsel of God. Yeah. And if you want to find out what a true church is, they have to have church discipline. Somebody say church discipline. Church, church discipline. discipline. Many of our churches lack so, so much discipline. It's strange for us to hear church discipline as a mark of the church. Come on now. When I came here and I insisted that we be disciplined, people kept asking me, who do you think you are? Uh -huh. Amen. And I got a legal pad. And I put on the top, who I think I am as a pastor. Amen. So every time somebody said, who do you think you are? I would pull out the legal pad. I said, number one. Amen. And then I got to 27 and 30. They stopped asking me who I thought I was in my faith. Amen. Who well, can I go ahead and talk? Help yourself. Uh, but, 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 but they were trying to find what was the true church in the midst of uh, churches that did not seem like they had the truth. Uh -huh. uh, letters that did not seem to be divinely inspired. Uh -huh. Leaders who used the gospel to make money. Uh -huh. uh, people who fought with each other and some people uh, had different doctrines that we should that you should be eating and dancing and getting drunk in the church. Uh -huh. This is an ancient time. Uh -huh. And they had to fight to make it clear what the true church should be. Uh -huh. uh, if you've been walking with God in your own life, I believe you have seen the marks of a true church. In my own life, I've seen a true church. Now, I've worked in every kind of church. Amen. I preach. I was writing down all the denominations. I preach for everybody. Uh, Mom died. A, a Catholic father let me preach in a Catholic church. He let me preach. He ain't never heard me preach. And I was hollering and getting this thing. They were just looking at me. Amen. They were stunned. You could stop the nine. Once you, if you give me the white, that's it. Amen. And uh, when it was over, he came to me and said, that was really something. I'm not sure what he's talking about. I don't know if he liked it or he hated it, but uh, the Lord has shown me a lot of different churches, and I want to testify. I have seen the greatness of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't mean the denomination. I mean, the church, Jesus said, upon this rock, 
I'll build what? My church. My church. My church. The church that belongs to Jesus. Yeah. I have seen how great it really is. Uh -huh. I seen it first in the church, I believe, 841, 741, West 71st Street, New Friendship Baptist Church, where the pastor was my grandmother's brother, my great uncle Stroy's ring. It was excitement in the church. Had one of the best choirs in the city. Every Sunday, the ushers marched in with the hand behind their back. And the smaller they're back, oh, y'all don't know nothing about that. Come this far by faith, amen. And the choir sang, and people would jump and holler. My own mother would jump up and scream at the top of her voice and run around the church. Good man. It was exciting. Yeah. My uncle would be preaching, and all of a sudden the organ would come in, and the drum would come in, and people would fall out. And then back in that church, they used the, the wagon method. Amen. When you start shouting, they grab hands and held you in the middle like you was a wild wagon about to bust <laughs> out. Oh my God, the was exciting. But there was order in the church. Amen. I say the new friendship, there was energy in the church. Uh -huh. And it was a new friendship that I first learned to be concerned with the community. Because Reverend Troy Freeman was one of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's young allies. Uh -huh. One of his early allies. When Dr. King came to Chicago, amen, he had a great adversary who was head of the National Baptist Convention called Joseph Jackson. Joseph Jackson was so angry at Dr. King when Dr. King died and they changed the name of the street that uh, Dr. Jackson's church was on. His church was called Mount Olivet. When Dr. King died, they changed the name of the street to South Park, to King Drive. Dr. Jackson disliked Dr. King so much, he sealed the door. And the door was not open for almost 50 years. Mm. And he made people come in the side door so that they, couldn't have, they wouldn't have to put on the address King Drive. Oh, help me hold it up. Come on, come on. But I learned, amen, because I heard my uncle, Reverend James F. George, talk about his uncle, Reverend Troy Freeman. I heard my mother talk about her uncle. And I saw the remnants, amen, of the struggle of the civil rights movement. Then my uncle broke away. Well, he didn't break away. A woman named Susie Hyatt, a pastor died and the church began to die. A woman named Susie Hyde pulled the people together and said, we're not going to let our church die. We're going to let our church go on. A woman named Susie Hyde. And Susie Hyde called my mother and said, Hazel, ask your brother, would he come and preach for us? And so my uncle came and preached. And Susie Hyde said, Hazel, ask your brother, will he be our pastor? He said, no, the Lord want me to be an evangelist. But later on, Sister Hyde persisted. And he said, yes. Mm. And he came. Now, when you go and see Living Hope, it says founder, Reverend James F. Joy. And in one sense, he was, because he organized the court of Baptist. But the true founder was Susie Hyde. Mm. Oh, y'all don't want me to Come on, come on. So, in Living Hope, I saw that my uncle had faith. He, we went from one place to another. He had faith. He, he went out in the street, talked to people who were dangerous. We also had the excitement. We also had the shouting. Amen. Brother named Floyd Taylor. Floyd would shout so hard, Floyd ran into the wall one day. Pow! And fell back. Amen. And Floyd fell out. Amen. So I, I saw them. Somebody took their shoe and they put it over his face. Like that. <laughs> and he woke up. Amen. Hallelujah. If you see somebody shout, they fall out, just get a man's shoe. Amen. And just put it over their face. And that'll wake them right up. Oh, but we had, uh, we had work. And in, in, in Living Hope, I learned how to work. On Sunday after communion, the women would be washing the cups and uh, washing the communion elements. And they would have us drink the leftover grape juice because they didn't want to throw it away because it had been prayed for. And we had to sweep the church. We had to clean up. I learned from Reverend James F. Joy, community service. My uncle had a tent because he believed we had to preach to the people in the neighborhood. See, I didn't, I didn't make this stuff up. I was trained in all of this stuff. On, My uncle taught me you have to reach the surrounding area because Jesus said you'll be witnesses in uh, Jerusalem, Judea, to the uttermost parts of the earth. So he had a tent, hallelujah, and he preached under the tent. 
and people came around just to see what the heck was going on. We were shouting and dancing, and many people in our community got saved. After I went off to college, he began to have neighborhood parades. He would have a parade, they would get floats, and people, they would bang the drum, and so the people look out and say, what are the church people doing now? Amen. The church people was on a float, waving, talking about the Lord, because my uncle realized we had to evangelize. We had to serve the community. Right. Oh, I remember Ernestine Mitchell, my Sunday school teacher, Emily Holland, Gene Martin, my youth leader. And I remember Sister Barbara Jordan, the first lady, Reverend Jordan's wife. They taught us in living hope the greatness of the church. Then I went to college, and the yeah. Lord brought me to another church, Faith Temple oh. Church of God in Christ. Amen. Pastor Elder Carlos Moody later elected to the bishopric and became oh. Bishop Carlos Moody. And I learned some deep lessons about the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh -huh. Woo, help me, Holy Ghost. Uh -huh. Bishop Moody's church was in order. Bishop Moody walked in, everybody stood up. Bishop Moody's church was in order. If a preacher was preaching something, Bishop Moody didn't like Bishop Moody would stop him right then. Bishop Moody's church was in order. Church was beautiful. And the church, listen, nobody wears hats like people in the church of God in Christ. Uh -huh. yeah. Women in the church of God in Christ would have a hat that would be big enough to cover two people. <laughs> and they would be sitting under those hats and they had dresses with diamonds and sequins. I would notice this because I was in college. I had too many suits. I didn't like wearing suits anyway. And so I, <laughs> I dressed as a bum. Amen. People looked at me like, oh, the homeless are here. Amen. <laughs> and I'd be sitting next to somebody all dressed to the nine. I mean, $300 shoes, everything. Christian Wooden was always immaculate. Amen. Immaculate suit. Oh, but I learned so much. I learned about the beauty of the church. He had night service. Amen. So people would go home and rest, and then he'd come back at 7 o'clock. He was on the radio, and he would say, Christ is the answer. I learned about the intensity. That's when I learned how to really shout. And maybe we had shouting and living hope, but the Church of God in Christ took it to another level. I learned about prayer lines. I learned about laying hands. I learned about being slain in the spirit. I learned about prophets. I learned all of that stuff, and I learned about nation building. Uh -huh. Because Bishop Moody wasn't content just to have a great church. He built a school. He had ways that people could save, and he helped everybody in this church financially. And yeah. finally, the Lord has brought me here in my life to the church of the open door. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. In the church of the open door, we have seen the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We've seen the greatness of the church. I'm not saying church of the open door is great because I'm the pastor. Amen. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the church of the open door is great because the four marks, whether you take the Protestant four marks or Ignatius four marks, are here in the church. Amen. And in the church, we've seen the people, we've seen us struggle for the community. We've seen faith. We've seen order. We've seen excellence. We've seen nation building. I tell you, listen, don't look for TV to tell you because it's not going to tell you. TV is the word. Amen. Don't look for schools to tell you. They're not going to tell you. Schools are institutions of the world. You have to listen to me when I tell you that the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ shows the greatness and the beauty and the glory of God. I say this because I've learned in 30 years being here, over 45 years preaching, I've learned black folk are so messed up that some of them, even when they're in the midst of something good, they can't tell. And so a lot of you all in the midst of God doing things right here in this church, you don't even know how great it is. Mm -hmm. You waiting for Channel 2579 or Cable to tell you. Uh-uh. I came to tell you today. This is a great church that God has blessed us with. And we ought to give God a big hand. Hallelujah. Well, I got to close. So let me just get to the Bible just a little bit, then I'm finished. Uh, what was the title of the sermon? Church matters. Uh, talk to me. What was the title of this sermon? Church matters. If you intend to be victorious in the COVID period, you have to know that church matters. That's right. Don't be one of these people that's getting divorced and separated from the church. I got three points, amen, and then I'm finished. How many points did I say? I had? Three. Amen. Number one, everybody repeat after me. When the church is working right. When the church is working right. It provides spiritual growth. It provides spiritual growth. And it makes us to be built up. It makes us to be built up. In love. In love. When it's working right. When it's working right. Grab your Bible and go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And in Ephesians chapter 4, I just want to look at verse 16. Uh -huh. I'm reading this today from a beautiful Bible someone gave me, a New Living Translation. 
Cassia Doctor in Bible, she introduced me to. Amen. And it's been a blessing. But I was reading this, and I want to read in the New Living Translation, Ephesians 4. And let me start uh, with 15. Ephesians 4 and 15. 16 is my key verse, but let me get the, back it up, get the context in 15. He, listen what it says. Amen. It says, everybody stand. Amen. Everybody stand. Some of y'all want to sleep. Amen. Wake the sleep up. Stand him up. Deacon, wake the sleep up. Amen. Stand up, son. Stand up, son. We read the Bible. Get the Bible. Ephesians 4. See, the devil puts you to sleep when the word comes. Amen. Amen. Church, I'm telling you, I break the church. The devil said, Oh, sleep now. Sleep now. He don't want you to know that. He wants you to be praising some singer or some football team. They're not coming to your house when you get messed up. But Jesus is. Uh huh. So Ephesians 4 to 15. In the New Living Translation, it says, Instead, we speak the truth in love. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body, the whole church, fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Mm -hmm. uh, a second point, amen, is that you may be seated. A second point is our point is read in the text. That uh, within the church, we experience the divine open door. Everybody read after me. Within the church, within the church, church we, experience we experience the divine open door. The divine the open door. door. And my third point would be that uh, everybody read after me. Point three. Point three. The true church, the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Lord Jesus Christ is indestructible. Is indestructible. Let me say a little bit more about each of these three points that I said. Number one, hallelujah. When the church is working right, the church provides spiritual growth and allows its members to be built up in love. Uh -huh. Or allows its members to be built up by love. Always remember this. You want to build somebody up, it's through love. Now, the truth of the matter is the church does not always work right uh -huh. because of human sinfulness. Yeah. Many of you watching might belong to a church where things are not going right. You can't say your church is a great church. Mm -hmm. Even fussing and fighting, even pre-COVID. Well, that's because human beings are sinful. But don't let that make you miss the great point that God has. Our aim should be to have the church work right. That's right. Our determination should be to have the church work right. Uh -huh. And this is important. Every member should have that as a goal. Uh -huh. People bring you gossip and say, uh-uh, no gossip. Because my aim is that the church works right. Yeah. People want to tear down people, you say, uh-uh, you can't get with me to tell people down in the church. Because my aim is that the church should work right. When people right. tell you, I ain't, keep, keep your money, I ain't giving no man my money. You give man your money every day. That's right. You give the government your money for you to see. Stop all that, I don't want to give man my money. We black people are so silly. People are so silly. Yeah. Amen. The government got your money. And then you go to the lotto and give them your money. And they ain't gave you nothing. You go to the casino and give your money. They ain't gave you nothing. You're giving everybody else your money. They ain't gave you nothing. Hallelujah. You get in trouble, you run in the church. And the church helps right. you. That's right. Our determination, our goal, the reason we're disciplined is so that the church works right. right. And uh, listen, when the church works right, hallelujah. Members grow. That's right. If you have not grown in the church, maybe you haven't invested enough in the church. Uh -huh. Because when the church works like God wants it to work, people get nourished. We had a men's Bible study Friday night. It was mind blowing. Yeah. We got into the issues of health and we got into the issues, not just general health, our health. And it was mind blowing the profundity that God brought out, the truth that God brought out, that helps men to struggle for their health. Uh huh. Another thing that happens when the church is working right, people get built up in love. That's right. Somebody said to me the other day that they had, uh, they were down a little bit physically, but that everybody called them and prayed for them and encouraged them, and they said, we have a great fellowship in our church. Uh -huh. Amen. Don't wait until it's gone for you to recognize the great fellowship. Come on. It's a fellowship that's based in love. in love. When people love one another, and love is work. Amen. Love is work motivated. You gotta work to really love people. Like I ain't talking about romantic love. That's a feeling. Amen. If I give you five dollars, you'll feel good. If I snatch it, you'll feel better. 
If I hug you, you feel good. If I smack you, you feel bad. Don't go by your feelings. Amen. Go by faith. Go by real life. And love is always work. Can I go ahead and preach? Yeah. Well, that's the first point. When the church is working right, hallelujah, it's going to allow people to grow. And I don't know about you, but I have grown since I've been in the church. Anybody else grown since you've been in the church? I don't know about you, but the Lord has blessed me since I've been in the church. Anybody yeah. else been left? You've been in the church? Oh, glory be to God. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, that's the first point. Uh, the members grow, and then people are built up by love. Look at somebody and say, love people so they can be built up. Love people so they can be built up. And look on the other side and say, the church should be full of love. The church should be full of love. Look at somebody and say, you got to love me, <laughs> even though I'm unlovable sometimes. <laughs> Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Help me. That's why the man said that Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. You got to love people with Jesus' love because people get on your nerves. You make you sick. Come on. You make you tired. Come on. But always remember, you one of them. That's right. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. The second point is that in the church, there are two open doors. One is an open door in heaven. Yeah. Another is an open door on the earth. Yeah. Are y'all listening to what I said? Come on. To, to the Philadelphians, I put in you an open door. But in, uh, where is it? In uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and 9, uh, Paul says there's a, a door open for me. Hallelujah. But there are many adversaries. And then in the book of uh, Revelations, I believe Revelations 4, somewhere there around 16, it says, Behold, I looked in heaven and there was an open door. So there are open doors on earth and there are open doors in heaven. But the open door on earth, God said, if I open the door, nobody can shut it. Come on, man. You only had a little strength, but I put in an open door. You kept my word. You kept my name. And because of that, I'm going to give you opportunity that nobody can take from you. When God opened the door, no one can shut the door. Come oh, on. glory be to God. Oh, hey. Yeah. Hallelujah. When God opens the door, it's a door of opportunity. Nobody can stop it. When God opens the door, it's a door of blessing. Nobody can close it. When God opens the door, it's a door of victory. And so tell your neighbor, walk through the open door. Walk through the open door. Hallelujah. Say, neighbor, I know we're in a time of crisis. I know we're in a time of crisis. But walk through the open door. Walk through the open door. Because nobody can close the door. That God has opened for you. Everybody that received that, put your hand together and give God a hand. So the church matters because when it's working right, you can grow and be built up. That's the right. church matters because in the church, there's an open door. Yes. Hallelujah. Life can mess you up so much, you can think all doors to me are closed. Life can hem you in so much, you can think all my opportunities are bound up. But when you know the Lord, the Lord lets you know, I put in the church an open door, and I'm going to make an opportunity for you to be blessed. The devil is a lie when the devil tells you there's no open door. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Look at your neighbor and say, the devil is a liar. The the devil is a liar. There's an open door right here. There's an open door right here. Mm -hmm. Let me leave that alone. Go to the third point. The third point, the church matters because it is indestructible. Somebody said the church matters. Church matters. Because it is indestructible. Because it's indestructible. The Lord Jesus, amen, uh, said, uh, upon this rock I build my church. Hallelujah. And he gives another example of a person who obeyed his word who was like a house built on a rock. When the storm came, the storm hit the house, but the house stood. The person who did not obey the word of Jesus, the storm came and the house was destroyed. There is something about the rock that is indestructible. Mm -hmm. We got to realize storms will come. Oh, yes. Trials will come. Mm-hmm. My friend, Dr. Jane Green, says you either just got out of the trouble, or you in trouble, or you headed for trouble. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But if you stay in the church, the Lord Jesus has guaranteed you will have the quality of indestructibility. Uh -huh. If you stay in the church, you will find that when others have perished, God's grace has still kept you. Thank you. If you stay in the church, you will find 
that the friend you thought was so strong is gone. Mm. But you're still here saying glory be to God. Glory. Glory. So Paul in Acts the 27th chapter was in the boat. And the boat was coming up on the storm. So some men said, look, we need to get out of this boat. And they let down the little boat. And they were going to get in that thing and it would be safe. And Paul told them, uh -uh, unless you stay in the ship, you can't be safe. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, neighbor. Neighbor. The enemy want to tell you to get out the ship. The enemy want to tell you to get out the ship. The ship is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But stay in the ship. Because unless you stay in the ship, you can't be saved. Somebody shout hallelujah. Look on our side say, neighbor. Stay in the ship. Tell them, neighbor. You gotta stay. You gotta stay where the Lord, where the Lord has, declared has declared that nothing that nothing can overcome you. Look at somebody said, neighbor. The Lord has said that if you're in the ship, the gates of hell, all the demons of hell.